Um, okay, so here's some examples of some different kinds of machines that you might come across. All the machines do the same thing. They are all shock boxes. So whether it's a green one with lots of pictures, or if it's this one that you just push the button and it turns on by itself, or this one that we just practice with, they all do exactly the same thing. So each machine is a little bit different. Turn it on. Once you get it on, follow the prompts and you're good to go. They all shock the casualty. Um, and you were mentioning, Mia, that uh, this is safe for somebody over eight years old, but then you mentioned that between one and eight is okay. Uh, could you just clarify that for me? Like, what would happen if, say, my three-year-old were to have, have a problem at the pool or something? Uh, we can still use it for a child. There are pads that are specifically designed for children age one to eight, but not all machines carry them. In fact, very few do. So if you, don't, if you see a pad separate that says child pad, then you would use that. But if you don't see it, and most machines don't have them, then you would just use adult pads on a child. Um, and that's safe to do if, if it's not available? Yes, but we just do not use um, a defib on a child under one. It's, it's not proven to be effective, so we don't, and it's, it's a lot of jewels for a small body. And as far as the CPR goes, for those who uh, don't know how to do CPR, is it that safe and, and you can do that the same as well for somebody under eight? Uh, yes. For a child, we're going to push a little bit less, about one-third to one-half the depth of the chest. So we push less and we give less air because their lungs are smaller and their chest is smaller. So you can use one hand or two to push for a child. It's totally up to you. As long as you push less, um, so about less than half the, the chest depth, and give less air. But it's still 30 compressions and two breaths. No difference there. Just push less. One of the, one of the things that you were talking about as well was uh, drying off the patient's chest, mm -hmm. or the, the casualties chest. Um, so in that case, like when you say dry it off, are we just drying the area that's going to be uh, in contact with the pads, or are we actually going to like give them a good scrubbing, or what's the, what's the idea? Um, what we're trying to do is the pad itself has to, has to have at least 80% contact on the chest. So that's why if the casualty is very hairy or if he's wet, when I put the pad on top, it's not going to stick. If it doesn't stick, then the um, energy that's coming from pad to pad will, in fact, skim over the top of the casualty. And we don't want that to happen. We want it to go in the casualty through the heart and to the other pad and back the same way. Um, the electrodes come through, uh, through the electricity comes through the body. So we want it to be um, dry. We want to take the, um, if you're obviously outside in the, in the rain, pouring rain, try to get them to a dry location. But if it's a little bit um, spitting, as long as it's dry and you put the pads on top um, of dry skin, then you're good to go. Where can we expect to see a defibrillator, uh, as in like when we would encounter a situation where it's necessary? Where, where would you expect to see one? Uh, basically, in every public place, you could uh, see a defibrillator. When you arrive um, at a building, let's say you go to the library or to an arena, when, you're, when you um, come in the front doors, it should have some kind of a sign on the front door that says that there's an AED there. Um, and if you see the sign, then you know that there's an AED, usually in the front, as soon as you arrive on the scene. So that, let's say I'm at an arena, and I'm watching my kids play hockey and the person besides me goes down, he hits the floor, I start my CPR and I send the nearest person to get that machine off the wall. Even if I'm not trained, they'll pull it off the wall and bring it to me. When you pull it off the wall in almost every case, especially in a public place, um, an alarm system will go off. And so the person who is trained to use it will hear the alarm or somebody will go and get the person who's working at the arena to then uh, come and use the machine. But in the meantime, if, if that person is at the back of the arena, it could be, you know, four or five minutes before they get to the front. So you've lost 50% chance right there. So the quicker you can get the pads on the casualty, the better chance they have. Just put on the pads, follow the prompts, and until somebody else arrives on the scene and, and takes over for you. So is this powered by plutonium or like what, what keeps this thing running when it's just hanging on the wall there? And the machine has a lithium battery, and the, most of the machines have um, lithium batteries that are good anywhere between three and five years. So this is rechargeable? Uh, no, it's not. It's not, okay. it's not rechargeable. So once, um, after you use the machine, obviously you have to uh, put new pads on and everything. The machine will need to be serviced. But the machine itself actually checks itself. Every AED checks itself at 3 o'clock in the morning. So it self-checks, and it will tell you if it's sick. So the little light will come on to tell you. And the person, wherever the machine is, they are supposed to look at the machine daily to make sure that the, the little light is on. It's still green, and it's ready to go. 
If the battery is low, it will start to beep to warn them, time to get a new battery. Even if the machine is beeping, low battery, low battery, you're still going to use it because you, stood, you still, in most cases, have a good 15 shocks left even in a low battery situation. So you use it until the machine stops. Is there any chance that this could shock a person who is in normal rhythm? No. Uh, the machine itself does not detect a pulse. As I said before, it only detects fibrillation. So it's looking for two different kinds of rhythms, and it only detects those rhythms. So the machine itself cannot shock somebody with a pulse. Um, but it, in, in, in return, it doesn't know what a pulse is. So it only shocks the two rhythms, um, the fibrillation ones that we were talking about, or tachycardia where it's going a little bit too fast. It only knows certain rhythms, and it knows if I feel these rhythms, I should shock it. And so that's, so it can't, cannot shock somebody with a pulse. So I couldn't, you know, use it and slap it on at a Christmas party or something and shock somebody. Um, it, it, it will say, uh, what the machine will say is no shock advised, and then you would then uh, look for any signs of life, movement, coughing, vomiting. If there's no sign of life, start CPR and, and keep doing it. Because when you use the machine, it doesn't always say shock. It could be a non-shockable rhythm. And you can go do a little CPR for your two minutes and it could pump it, put it into a shockable rhythm and that's our goal. As long as it says to shock, it means we're, we're on the process of saving him. And if it says don't shock, then don't shock, we do just CPR. So Mia, what if you encounter someone who already has an implanted pacemaker? Uh, if you arrive on the scene, what you're going to do when you bear the chest, you would notice because they're going to have a scar. That's how you're going to know it's a pacemaker. So when you see the scar in the chest, you're going to put your hand over the scar and you should feel what feels like a loony or a toony underneath it. If you feel that, you want to make sure that when you put the pads on the casualty, that the pads are at least one inch away from the casualty or from the, um, from the pacemaker. Right. So as long as they're about one inch away, then, then you're okay. You can go ahead and use it. In almost every case, we're going to use... Uh, use it regardless because the casualty is not living and it's not breathing so anything we can do is better. For instance a pregnant casualty um, we're going to use it for a pregnant casualty also. If there's a lot of jewelry we might need to move it but it's not my, my main priority. I'll, I'll try my best. Um, so that's pretty much. And also, if I see a patch on the casualty, he might have um, or she might have a patch medication that they would have on, um, such as nitro, nitroglycerin. So the patch is on. We need to remove that patch first. So ideally, I would use my glove to remove the patch. And don't stick it on yourself. And don't stick it on yourself. Because, again, if I touch it with my bare hands, it, the um, medication will be absorbed through my body and it will make me sick. Or I can use um, a cloth, um, the end of my shirt, anything to pull the patch off, wipe it down, and then go ahead and use it. And if you don't know what the patch is, because it, it could be, you know, a birth control, it could be something to stop them from smoking. Uh, I don't know what the patch is. I'm not going to take the time to read it. Just pull whatever patch you see off um, and go ahead and put the pads on and uh, follow the prompts. Yeah, it seems pretty straightforward. So Mia, we'd just like to thank you for joining us, um, doing a feature on Category 5 TV. Um, how, so how can people get more information on AEDs? If they're looking for more information about AEDs or the, to purchase one or to get training so that they can uh, use the machine um, a little more confidently, uh, they can uh, refer to our website at www.sja.ca. Great. Thanks so much. And hopefully you'll never have to use one of these, but if you run into the occasion, then now you'll know how to use an automated external defibrillator. I think it's important that um, we should mention that um, defibrillation doesn't work all the time, so um, even if you do go and rip it down from the wall and mm. you go and shock somebody and, and maybe it doesn't work, well, at least you made the attempt, and that's what's important. It's exactly like what Mia was saying. If you didn't do anything, mm -hmm. this person's dead. They're dead anyway, yeah. So whatever you can do, as Mia was saying in the mm -hmm. video, is better than what that person right. is right now. So right. it's like just to have that opportunity to uh, at least do what you can. To Takes a bit of pressure off. <laughs> yeah, and I think speaking of taking pressure off, you see how brilliant those machines are. Mm -hmm. Like that was an exceptional mm -hmm. model, that one that walks you through everything, including the CPR. We actually purposefully brought, like left that in for you just, just in case you've never uh, gone through CPR training and, you, and you're not really sure how that works because not all of them do walk you through everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but we definitely wanted to... Uh, 
to show you, you know, how it how it works and take some of that fear off of uh, off of pulling it off the wall.